good morning. I'm excited to be here today as we continue this series. Um, over the past few weeks, like Suzanne said, we've been diving into the book of James and going through it you know, chapter by chapter. And, and as we've done that, we've kind of been looking and pulling out some of the wisdom that James has for us, some of the truth that he has to speak into our lives. And, but we've also kind of been challenging ourselves to, to actually do something with it and not just to hear these words. Because James actually says in our series verse, don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says, otherwise you are only fooling yourselves. And so we've kind of been challenging ourselves to to hear what God's saying, to to hear these truths, but also to to live it out in our daily lives, to actually do something, to not just know it, but to grow into it and live it in our lives. And so we're going to do that again today, and we're going to be looking at chapter 4 of James. And right off of the bat, as soon as he starts this chapter, he really starts to set the tone for what he's going to address, this issue that he's going to address in this chapter. And so we're going to look at his first words, and then we're going to hear about how he says we should work through this and and what we can do to overcome what has turned into a little bit of a problem for these, these people. And so he says this. He says, what causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You desire, but you do not have, so you kill. You covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. And when you ask, you do not receive because you ask with the wrong motives, that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. And so there, you can see there's a lot going on here. There is a lot of tension there's a lot of conflict between these people. There's a lot going on. These people are, are being very selfish. They're trying to pursue these things that they want and they think, and, and it's causing a lot of problems. And if I was going to give this problem a word, I would say that they're struggling with this problem of disunity. They're not working together. They're not getting along. And, it's, and, and, and I think that if we look around in our world today, we kind of feel that same way sometimes. You know, we live in a world right now that's pretty, that's really struggling with unity. You know, you turn on the news or you look at your social media feeds or even just consider the conversations that you have with one another on a regular basis. And, and I think that we understand this. You know, we feel that and we know what it's like to be in a place of disunity. And so I just want to pull out a few things that, that James highlights because as Christians, you know, we're called to be unified. And so we recognize that this is a problem. And so we have to understand what are some of the causes for this problem before we can figure out what to do next. And so the first thing that he mentions is that it's a problem with our desires. You know, we all have things that we want. We all have things that we think we deserve. We all have things that we think we need. And we're going to do whatever it takes to get those things. It's all about us. It's all about what makes us happy. It's all about what makes us feel good. And we don't necessarily take into account other people. We don't necessarily take into account God. We just think about what we desire. And that's a problem. Because when we start thinking about that, and we start focusing all of our time on that, it starts to even cause some competition between ourselves. So if we're, we're really focused on what we want and what we think, and we think that we're great and we deserve everything, then we're going to start seeing what other people have too. And we're going to be like, well, I want that too, and so I'm going to try to fight you for that. I'm going to try to be better than that. I'm going to try to get the best and more and all this, and it just causes this conflict, causes this competition between one another, and it causes this disunity. And part of our problem is that our motive is wrong. You know, one of the things that James says is that you're not even asking God. And sometimes we do that too. We don't take the time to consult God when we pursue something. We don't take the time to ask God if this is right, if this is good, if this is what I'm supposed to be doing, if this is a desire of God. And so when our motive is out of place, when we're not thinking through things in the right process, then that's going to cause other things to fall apart. And it's going to cause that disunity between ourselves and between one another. And then ultimately, we have an attitude problem. Because once we get this far along, we're so far into our desires, we're so far into pursuing what we think is best, we're not going to admit that we're wrong. We're not going to turn around and say, well, I'm not going to do this anymore. No, we're proud and, and we wanna, we're selfish and we want to keep pursuing that. We don't want to admit that we're wrong. And so we have a problem with our attitude. And all of these things combined cause for a lot of tension, cause for a lot of conflict, and cause us to be divided with one another. And I see this disunity playing out on several levels. 
And on the first level, there's simply a disunity between us and other people, just, just people in general, maybe the people that you work with, maybe the people that you see on a daily basis, your neighbors, maybe friends, family, just general people that we just feel this disunity and tension with. You know, I read an article just yesterday about a man in Homewood, and he had left his Christmas lights up a little too long. Now, I know that there are some people who are very serious about when Christmas starts and when Christmas ends, and I get that that's a very real and important thing, but this took kind of a nasty turn. And so this older man had left his lights up a little too long, and he got a letter in the mail from a neighbor. And in this letter, this neighbor told him that he needed to take his Christmas lights down because this person was concerned about how that was going to affect uh, the property values of their neighborhood and just how the general appeal of the neighborhood, what people were going to think about it. And he even went so far to tell him that if he didn't, if he wasn't able to take that stuff down, that maybe he should just sell his house and move so that somebody else could come in and take care of it or maybe just tear the house down and build a better one. And I was so shocked by that. I know, right? Like, I was so shocked by this that someone would have the audacity to send somebody a letter like that because that person was obviously so concerned about what he thought the neighborhood should be like and what he thought things should look like that he didn't take the time to consider, you know, what, what was going on with that man. I mean, maybe there was a reason. Maybe he needed help. And, and so there was never a conversation. And can you imagine the tension that causes in that neighborhood? Now, the good news is is that it turns out well, and sometimes we get things right, and actually the rest of his neighbors found out, and they put up Christmas lights too. So, (laughs) yeah, so that there is good, and we get it right sometimes, but when we get it wrong, it hurts, and it causes problems, and it, it causes disunity with the people around us, and we see this play out in all kinds of ways in our lives. But then on another level, as if it's not bad enough that we can't get along with one another in general, we also have a problem with disunity among ourselves and other Christians. Yes. <laughs> and so um, we actually experienced that a little bit this week. It was very interesting here at Heritage. We tried to do something a little unconventional, I guess. And now when you start messing with traditions and you start messing with things that people really hold on to, it, it can get a little sticky. Um, but this past week was Ash Wednesday, and we'd never done anything with that before, but we thought, hey, let's give it a shot. Maybe we'll reach some people and maybe give somebody an opportunity to meet with God. And so we did a drive through Ashes. And we promoted this. We put a little ad on Facebook, and we, it was on the news. Maybe you saw Suzanne and, <laughs> or Michael. And, um, but, and so we promoted this, and we started to get some feedback. And some of that feedback was surprising because, let's face it, guys, you know, Christians can be a little mean sometimes. Yeah. Christians can be a little snarky. And so we got feedback from people saying, well, this is offensive, and this is irreverent. And talking about how we're trying to turn church into a drive through a fast food place. And it, it was just so, it was so unnecessary. And so a little bit hurtful for the fact that we're all supposed to be on the same team, right? We're all working for the same thing, trying to share the love of Jesus. And we still tear each other down within that. We still think that our way is best and that we know what, how to do it. And that if you do it any other way, it's not right. But the truth of the matter is, is that the people who came through on Wednesday, it meant something to them. It touched their lives. It provided them with an opportunity to meet with Jesus that maybe they wouldn't have had or that maybe they wouldn't have felt comfortable with in another setting. And so we have to be careful about how we let disunity interrupt our lives and how we work together as Christians. And then ultimately, this disunity can seep into our lives and it's going to affect our relationship with God. You know, like James says, you're not consulting, you're not even asking of what asking God for anything. You know, and when we stop seeking that, when we stop looking for God, when we stop asking God what to do, when we stop spending that time building a relationship with God, then everything else is just going to fall apart. If we don't have that foundation right, how are we supposed to get any of the other stuff right? And so James is going to kind of give us some ideas for how maybe we can we can get back on the right track. How can we get back so that we can be unified, so that we can do the work of God together like we're called to do? And so the first thing that he says is that we basically need to re 
refocus. But before we get to refocus, um, he actually says this, and this is what's really surprising. He says, you adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means enemy against God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. And I don't know about you, but you hear those words and you're like, oh man, like, I've probably made some mistakes. Because we have this desire to, to live for God. We want to live for God. We say we're going to live for God. But then we start thinking, oh, well, I need to get this done so that I can do well at work. And, oh, I need to get this done so that people think that, you know, I have my act together. And we start living for these things in the world that we think that we're supposed to live. And, and James says that we can't do that. That when we do that, we're actually becoming an enemy with God. But a lot of times we find ourselves being double-minded. I don't know if anyone's ever told you this before, but you, they say that you can't do two things at once. And a lot of times we like to say, oh, yes, I can. I can do two things at once. I'm great at it. And, but eventually, the truth of the matter is, is that something's probably falling apart. Something's not getting the attention that it needs. You know, the past month, I have been traveling to Kentucky on the weekends to go to school. And I've been working during the week. And then, you know, I, I'm coming home and I'm, I'm doing this for a whole month. And I think I'm doing great. I'm sure that I was wonderful to everyone. <laughs> but the chances are, the more reality is, is that there are probably times when I didn't get everything I needed to get done for work. And there were probably times that I turned in some pretty subpar assignments for school. And I probably wasn't always so kind to my husband when I got home. And because I can't, you just, we just can't. We can't try to be everything to everyone and expect it all to just be perfect. We can't be double-minded people. And so we have to figure out how do we, how do we focus in? How do we become single-minded? And, and for us, our one thing, like we just sang in the song, is to be focused on God. And so James has some advice for us on how to refocus. Because that's step number one. If we're going to work together, is we have to refocus on what's important. We have to keep the main thing the main thing. And this is what he says. He says, you submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come near to God and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. And so from this, we can pull a lot of what it takes to refocus our hearts and refocus our lives on the one thing that matters. And the first thing that we have to do is we have to submit to God. We have to let go of the control. We have to let go of our desires. We have to let go of what we think we know and let God be God. And that means we have to invest in in spending time in prayer. We have to invest in reading God's word and learning about what it is that God actually wants for us, what God desires for us, and let God take over every part of our life. And once we do that, then we need to start avoiding evil. So we all have evil in our lives, things that that bring us down, things that aren't good for us, and we know these things, but sometimes we're just sucked into them. And we have to figure out the ways, how do we give that up? How do we move away from that so that it's not consuming us, so it's not blocking our view? And we have to identify those things and move away from them and be intentional about it. I know for me that an evil in my life is that I get really hung up on opinions of others. I care what you guys think about me, and I shouldn't, (laughs) but I do. And it makes me anxious, and it makes me worried, and it makes me frustrated and angry when I feel like I'm not living up to what I think I need, and I get so consumed by those opinions, and that's an evil for me. And I need that out of my life, because I can't focus on what God wants me to do when I'm letting that work off in my life. And so we have to figure out, what is the evil in my life And how can I move away from it? How can I get rid of it? And then once we do that, then we need to start purifying our lives. We need to seek purity. And we don't always talk a whole lot about this, but but I think it's important in all aspects of our lives. We have to consider, you know, is what I'm saying good? Is what is, Are the thoughts that I have, are they good? Is this what God desires? You know, we got a really good uh, practice of this this past week. So like Suzanne mentioned earlier, if you were here and you did the rubber band challenge, we got rubber bands and we we're supposed to switch our wrists each time that we said something maybe not so nice or, or thought about something so nice and maybe some of us broke our rubber bands this week and that's okay. But that's a good practice for us to figure out how can I purify that area of my life? How can I seek purity in that? And so as we think about all the things that we do and all the things that we say and all the things that we think, 
we can run through those things. Is this good? Is this right? Is this what God would want? And that can make a big difference in our lives. And then finally, we have to learn how to practice repentance. And repentance is just kind of a fancy word of saying that we need to to acknowledge our sins, acknowledge our mistakes, acknowledge our failures, and turn away from them and move on and start over and ask for forgiveness. And this can be really hard for us to do. We don't like to admit when we're wrong. If we think that we're wrong, we just go find people who think we're right and we pretend like it's fine. But we can't do that. We have to be honest and we have to practice repentance because there's nothing more freeing than when we're honest with God and we're honest with others about the mistakes we've made and the things we've done wrong and feeling that forgiveness and that grace free us up to really live our lives for God. Because we can't focus on God if we're too buried in our shame and our unhappiness about all the things that we've failed at. And so these are the things that James says that we can do to turn our focus back to God. When I was in high school, I learned a prayer that has been very helpful to me when I feel those times when I'm getting off track or when I feel like maybe I'm feeling a lot of disunity in my life. And it's a prayer that I still turn to, and I want to teach it to you guys today. Um, but you're going to have to get involved, so stretch your fingers because you're going to need your hands. And, and we're just going to do this together, and hopefully it'll just bring us and help us understand just how important it is to have God in all that we do. And so it goes like this. It says, Christ be in my mind and in my thinking. Christ be in my eyes and in my seeing. Christ be in my ears and in my hearing. Christ be in my mouth and in my speaking. Christ be in my heart and in my loving. Christ be in my life and in my living. And when I say that prayer and I remember that and I work through those motions, I'm reminded of how important it is that God be in everything I do. And it helps me to refocus and remember what's most important. And so once we've kind of gotten a handle on that and we, we feel like we're working towards refocusing on God and what's most important, then it's time for step two. And step two can be a bit of a challenge. And, but James has a really good way of reminding us that in order for us to work together, in order for us to be in unity with one another, we have to practice humility. And here's what he says. He says, you don't even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. I don't know if there's anything more humbling than to acknowledge that we only have a small bit of time here and that we can't spend our time wasting it on things that cause conflict and strife with one another, but instead we need to spend our time bringing love and grace and hope into the world instead. And so we have to learn how to practice humility. What is your life? What is your life? And so in order to do that, we have to do a few things. Step one, we have to give up control. So this is the second time that we've heard this. So this is a pretty important thing. We have to give up control and give it to God. You know, if we're going to practice humility, we can't be in charge. Because the reality is, is we're not here because we decided we were going to be here. We're here because God created us and God put us here. So we have to give up the control to the one who's really in control. So let's just go ahead and acknowledge that and it'll make it easier. And once we give up that control, then we have to take up honesty. So if we're going to be humble, if we're going to practice humility, then we have to acknowledge when we're wrong. We have to be honest about when we fail. We can be honest about what we're good at, but we also have to be honest about what we're not so good at because there's somebody who is good at it. And when we're honest with each other and we're vulnerable with each other, we're able to work together to fill in the gaps. And then finally, when we practice humility, we have to lift others up. So we have to take the focus off ourselves. We don't get to be first. And as Christians, we're taught this. We're taught that we're supposed to love our neighbor and that we're supposed to serve others. Jesus came as a servant for us, and so we're supposed to practice that and show that in our own lives. And so we have to love others. We have to respect them, even when they disagree with us. We have to be willing to build one another up instead of tear each other down. And when we do that, when we do all those things, we're able to practice humility and we're able to show 
that we are able to work together. And so when we have our focus right and we're practicing humility, then some of that tension and some of that conflict that we face in our lives will go away. Now here's the thing. We're going to mess up, and that's okay. We're going to make mistakes. We're going to fail. We're going to get double-minded again. We're going to start living for the wrong things again. We're going to start pursuing our desires. But here's the thing. There's always grace. And there's always a chance to start over and keep going. We don't have to be stuck. And James reminds us of this. He says, he says, he gives us more grace. God gives us more grace. That is why scripture says God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. So when you feel like, I can't possibly do anymore, I can't possibly keep changing, I can't keep possibly keep starting to get over again, we have to remember that there's always more grace. And that when we're able to let that grace into our lives, then it's going to fill in all those places where we fail and we're going to be able to work together. And it's going to keep us going and it's going to keep us moving so that we can work together to do what we've been called to do to bring Jesus to the world. Amen.